the artists, about the aesthetic of dyslexia. What are you guys looking forward to hear from today's guests? Well, I'm completely fascinated by um, Lenny and Kaz's um, ideas on the dyslexic aesthetic, and that's a real tongue twister for, yeah. me, for dyslexic to say. <laughs> But um, being a creative myself and being severely dyslexic, I would love to learn if there are any overlaps or something that I can relate to when they talk about what is the dyslexic aesthetic. And, um, and they also sort of mention that dyslexics are great storytellers, like better storytellers than someone that's a linear, linear thinker. So, yeah, super looking yeah, forward yeah, to hearing yeah. all about that. Yeah, and I'm really looking forward to um, hearing how Aaron's um, wonderful um, I Am Able um, movement is going, which we are fully behind. When we first came across Aaron, we were so excited to meet him because we were definitely singing from the same hymn sheet. Um, and then also just, again, looking forward to um, Christian talking about his wonderful font. Um, Sally Gardner, who is an author who was in um, one of the salons before, she wanted us to say a big thank you to Christian because actually his font has actually made the words stay still on the page. So um, that works really well for some dyslexics. Yeah. She's at a wedding and sends her love to you, Gil and Christian. <laughs> oh man, we adore her. Yeah. I, I just want to uh, uh, welcome everybody to just join our, uh, our salon. Um, please add any question through the chat this is why we do it this way to make sure that we can not only talk on the screen but also get you guys to uh add some questions and sentiments so we can connect this global community uh if you like what you hear today and you want to support us please follow us that would help our content rise to the top and always hashtag amazing dyslexic i am so excited for our guest today and i think that i don't want to spend any more time without bringing them on screen so let's bring our wonderful guests on please Yay. Hey, Aaron. Hey, hey, how's it going? Hey, Kaz, how are you guys? Thank you. It's a truly global uh, uh, event today. We got London, San Francisco, Amsterdam, LA. Um, so it's so lovely to see you all. Um, Christian, let's start with you. Can you tell us a little bit uh, who you are, what do you do? And in yep. one word, what is dyslexia, Christian, means to you? Yeah. Um, my name is Christian Boer. Uh, I'm a graphic designer, uh, designer of Dyslexia Font, and uh, co-founder of the Week of Dyslexia uh, here in uh, the Netherlands. And uh, yeah, my uh, one word for dyslexia, it's a hard one. There are so many things that come across my mind, but uh, first one would be uh, neurodiversity. Uh, what will bring dyslexia in, in the right perspective to other people. And it's easier to explain to uh, children also. That's yeah. what I like. Yeah, wonderful. I'm sure we're gonna get to talk more about that, but uh, Aaron, let's jump to you. So nice to see you, man. How are you? Tell us who you are, what do you do? And in one word, what does dyslexia mean to you? I'm Aaron Wolf. I am an actor, director. I founded the company Howling Wolf Productions. And I to me, dyslexia is one word and one word only, even though it's many words. But the first one that comes to my head like that is creativity. Mm -hmm. Because that is what I've gotten from what was originally branded as a disability mm -hmm. to me is actually my creativity. It's who I am. It's the visual mind. And I see it in so many other people as well. So it's not just me. I'm not saying it's not. It's me, meaning everyone who's in the same boat, same boat as all of us. Yeah. Well, perf perfect. Because today we're going to talk all about that, and I think we can all relate to the fact that uh, dyslexia is a gift, and it is a, a, a creativity in any in any industry in any field. Um, so I'm looking forward to get more into that. Uh, Lenny, wonderful to see you. Would you tell us, you know, who you are, what you do, and in one word, what is dyslexia to you? Hello, I'm Lenny Barbridis, founder of Dyspla, which I run with Casimir Dyslexia. Hello. Um, and I think, <laughs> I think the word Dyspla mean, means it all for me. Like, Dyspla means play. It means dyslexic play. So I feel that dyslexia means Dyspla, and Dyspla means play. So... It's, it's convenient because it's the name of the company. So that's <laughs> <what's> like. <Brilliant. laughs> 
And Kaz, tell us a little bit about what, what uh, what's your role? What do you do? And what's your word for dyslexia? So I'm I'm an artist, a video artist. So I work with Lens on this work. We do various projects. I'm currently working on a project, a uh, public art and augmented reality project, which is really fun, um, which um, should be finished next week, or at least pre first presented next week. But my one word for dyslexia, I find it difficult to detach myself from anything but well, the word, word dyslexia is the word dyslexia. Um, I mean, obviously, I, I, I mean, I, 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 there's DV, uh, any word that you would come up with, creativity or whatever, innovation or whatever, um, obviously there's deviations from that word. So my, my word would be dyslexia. I, I, I don't know if I'm going to fully do that, but I'm going to let you have it, you know, because Whoa. I know how creative you are and I know that you guys have so much to say about the dyslexia uh, and, and how you guys see the world. Um, so uh, I would love to hear more about that today. Uh, that was so how, meta. How you work for dyslexia? That was the most meta answer. Yes. Right, right. Very I, creative, right. I couldn't have thought of a better answer. Like, yeah. <laughs> What is the what do you think of when you think of God? God. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is complete. It is complete. It's everything and nothing and all at the same time, isn't it? Uh, um, God playing, I mean that's quite when now you're gonna associate dyslexia with God playing, which I think is really yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's oh, not that's that's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. massive. Oh, shall shall we sit with Kaz? Because uh, <laughs> Can I ask you a question first and then Lenny, I've got another question for you. But because of this dyslexic aesthetic, um, could you break that down for us, um, Kaz? Could you um, tell us exactly what you think the dyslexic aesthetic is? Cool. So an aesthetic is basically just how one sees, how one sees something, how one defines something. Um, so obviously you have a, a dyslexic aesthetic, um, which is purely based on um, what people who are dyslexic create. So it could be anything. Um, you can uh, delve into that obviously deeper and um, you look at the dyslexic traits. So um, some basic ones that probably everybody knows are based on um, uh, the dyslexic advantage. So um, Brock and E.B. Burnett's um, uh, ideas about mind scopes, um, which uh, what like material reasoning um interconnected uh narrative and dynamic reasoning um so basically you look at those ideas and look at things like episodic memory um 360 thinking um you could so i don't know um, sometimes um spielberg um is described as uh i can't remember the game terminology but basically someone who when they create a film it, you you walk into that world and that world is full. That world is 360, that world is complete. Um, mm -hmm. There are some filmmakers that don't do that. You walk into that world and it feels quite flat. Um, but with me specifically, when I'm viewing his work, um, I feel that there's a world beyond the screen. Mm -hmm. And I can feel that, I can see that. And, and that's, that's why I think his work is extremely popular. It's very holistic. Um, and immersive, as well. um, immersive yeah. sure. And uh, you could relate those directly to the strengths, 360 viewing, 360 ideas and strengths of dyslexia. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, our research is very, very vague. And we kind of like, um, I don't know if we coined coin the term, but we'd like to say we do, we had coined the term, the dyslexic aesthetic, when we first created a, um, a film festival back in um, 2018 in London which was looking specifically at um, uh, dyslexic and neurodivergent filmmakers. Um, so those with um, ADHD, autism, um, dyslexia, Tourette's, um, you know, synesthesia and so on. Um, and um, it kind of built from there, but it's it's not anything that's really highfalutin. It's, it's an aesthetic is literally anyone could define an aesthetic. There's obviously a, a Kazmir Bielecki aesthetic. Um, it can be in case of that. It's basically the identity or the personality sure. of something mm -hmm. yeah. that, that only becomes 
recognizable once you've built your profile. So it's like marketing. Once you build your brand, you understand mm -hmm. that the brand is associated with a specific company. And what we believe is that you can do the same with what, with a movement because it's not just our interpretation of the dyslexic aesthetic. It's the whole movements. So what are we doing as a movement, as a community, as a, as as bigger than just us to the point that we become a genre in our own right. So maybe in 20 years, in the same way that you've got your categories on Netflix, picking content by dyslexic filmmakers will be just another one of those genres that you can pick because there is something, there is a commonality between the dyslexic story maker, the dyslexic filmmaker that becomes global in that sense. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's the ambition. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and and with sales and marketing, you just have to sell it until you get lucky and someone believes you. Yes. So that that's what we're doing. We believe that this is a thing. I and think you would have just answered the second question, um, Lenny, because I was going to ask you. So how would you define it? But um, perfect definition. But I think it's yeah. like that. If you explain, I mean, real of all the dyslexic directors, they're they're all the main ones, aren't they? Are yeah, got, sure. So when you when you watch uh, like a Steve McQueen, like he had the what was it the little axe or small axe? I can never remember. Um, yeah. Without without knowing that he was dyslexic, do you look at that and go, "Oh yeah, he's he's tackled all that." Well, I, 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 I feel that you can. Sorry, babe. Yeah, I no, feel no, like no. you can spot it in dialogue. You can spot it mm. when you meet someone. We all have our radar that we meet someone and the way they're talking to us, we yeah, all you know. they're on the spectrum, the way that they're, <laughs> the conversation jumps around and we're not quite sure what, what they're talking about. Um, like there is something that defines us as, as a people. So mm. as, as a community, as a dyslexic, you know, and when I say dyslexic, I am talking about all of us as a, as a homogenous group, which I know you're not meant to do, <laughs> but I, Feel like to, there is something that we all have in common and it's this way that we communicate so it makes sense that the way dyslexic artists the way dyslexic artists work is similar they have a similar immediate way of making you interested and invested and emotionally affected by the story or the character that they are creating for you and that's why I think Spielberg is such a favorite because straight away you're rooting for his characters and it's not to say that people that aren't dyslexic can't do that, but I believe that they're better at it because they are. It's easier for them to get it's the way they think. Yeah. 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 And when you watch some films, especially sometimes, uh, sometimes when you watch British films, it feels a bit stilted. It feels a bit distant, or like they're trying too hard. And sometimes you can have all the things in place. You can have the money and the big name and the director, but it still doesn't flow. A, you know, there's like a something, and, and, and it is more with British films. And like me well, and Kaz, oh, stop interrupting me because I'm going to forget what I'm sorry, saying. Sorry, sorry. Um, and, and me and Kaz <laughs> talk about this in terms of like the Americans, the way American dyslexic filmmakers make films and the way that British filmmakers make films. And there is a huge difference. And I think that's to do with the way that the British industry is more controlled and more rigid and we're not allowed to be as free or as instinctive or, or as open. Everything's a little bit polite. Whereas in America, there's this feeling that, you know, you can swear on set and no one's going to cry. You know, like no one's going no to be offended because they understand that in the moment of punishment, <laughs> Wow, the cat. Oh, there she is! <laughs> <laughs> that's the cat! It's that's inspiring, you. Lenny, and the cat just felt it and leaped in the air to show solidarity <laughs> with your great observation. I, I, I love what you guys are saying. I want to acknowledge that we have a whole classroom of seventh and eighth uh, uh, grade uh, here from San Francisco join us today. Uh, welcome, welcome everybody that watching. We're so glad to have you here. There's some wonderful questions in the chat that I wanted to ask you, Aaron. You know, yeah. how does dyslexia help you uh, in your creative process? Like, wh where do you know? Does where does it help you? And when do you find maybe being a hindrance to how you think as as an actor and a producer and a writer? Tell us a little bit about the process so we can share some of your insights with our audience. Yeah, and I apologize for my uh, dyslexic cat. <laughs> <laughs> he just came out of nowhere, but. 
the process, what what was just being discussed about Spielberg, he's a great example. He's actually in our in our uh, trailer for I Am Able. And the process, which I'll get into in a sec, but the process of filmmaking for me and or visualizing a character, I was just doing this the other day on a set. And the process is, it becomes visual. I see it in my head because I'm not seeing, I, I'm not like just reading the words. I'm, I don't process things in that way. So I see the world, like you guys were saying about Spielberg. He is uh, visual, he creates a world, you step into that world and it's what makes him so good. It's what makes his creativity, you know, probably the most successful filmmaker ever because you really do, whether it's Raiders of the Lost Ark or Jurassic Park or um, even Easy. some of the more serious fare like Schindler, Schindler's List, Saving Private Ryan, you step into that world, you feel for the characters immediately. Now me, I'm not Steven Spielberg, but I, when I'm creating, when I'm acting, when I'm directing, I, I, I visualize, I see the world. I see where I'm going and what I'm a part of. I see the, the space instead of, seeing the words, I, I start to feel the space. So I actually will visualize for my creative process, I will visualize just about everything before it's there. So I'll, so then I'm just copying what's in my head because I already see the world. So then I'm copying it to make sure either as a character that I'm playing or as a, uh, a world that I'm creating or a scene or a set or a, even just like the production design for the set that I'm copying what I see in my head. And then when I see it on camera after it's filmed, it's either a yes, that's right, or no, it's not right. And so then in terms of the hindrances, the the tough parts, well, one was school. I mean, school was was is not designed for someone like myself. It is designed for someone who thinks in a more linear way and in a more way by rote. So that was a difficult thing to when we're told you're supposed to be normal, you're supposed to be one type of way, but you're not, it really makes things, it puts, it puts, at least speaking for myself, it puts, put me at a disadvantage in the education system. Mm -hmm. And I had to build up the courage to be comfortable with who I was. It didn't come from, it came from experience and from, finally being okay to say, here's who I am. Here's what I can do. Here's me acting. Here's me directing. Here's me writing. This is who I am. I'm not the best uh, biology student. Uh, I'm not going to nail a, bi a class in, in, uh, in deep English literature, but I can create something that I think is also impressive and important and doesn't need to be scaled down to not be as important as the other subjects, which is why I created this I am able movement and it's I am able dot info on online and we're in the, the beginning stages of it, but we've been getting a lot of, of cool things because it's about everyone coming out of the closet and being okay with your disability and saying I am proud. I am able to be I am I am okay. I am great at something. I struggle at things and I'm great at things because we all are. We all have our, we all have the things that we're great at and the things that we struggle with. It's just society is the thing that has told us that some people are disabled, are not able, mm -hmm. instead of everyone being able. I love that. I yeah. love how we're just looking at the same equation just from the full part of it and from the uh, what we what we see and do well. Um, great questions coming through the chat, and all of really really moving what you're saying, Aaron, about the idea that. You can see it in your mind completely. And I think that, you know, uh, Kaz was talking about uh, Eleni about the 360 thinking and 360 making. And then we can just then translate that into an object, a film, a story, a piece of art. Like it's, we kind of almost like, you know, channel it through and it just flows through us and become a uh, uh, reality. Um, I know, Christian, that you not only. Uh, 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 play with it, but you also sort of took on to say, how do we look at type? How do we look at design? How do we change those signifiers that uh, sometimes uh, create some challenges for us to sort of understand content through that more linear medium? 
how do you design for dyslexia or for neurodiversity or for different types of learning? Tell me a little bit about your thoughts uh, around that. Um, yeah, it, it, it started with the typeface where I consciously used what the problem is with reading. Uh, but sometimes I get questions from organizations to make things readable uh, also in layout. And in that way, it's... Yeah, yeah, if I look at Aaron and, and what was said earlier um, with visualization, um, it's it's that's something more creative kind of stuff. It's more uh, in in an image way, while reading and uh, of accessible reading um, is is just like one eighty back um in in the in in the hard way uh where you it's it is in a gray area of your brain like what am i doing wrong while i'm processing this information so it's while when i make a logo or something else i'm way in the visual uh part of my brain uh it's it's way ahead within a second i have it in my brain and i can produce it uh where uh, when I'm looking at accessible reading part, it's it's just yeah uh, bringing the hard hard part of your brain in that area. Mm -hmm. So um, it's it's when I hear um, uh, the part where you're telling about uh, Steven Spielberg and um, uh, I got all all kind of ideas also with that. Um, I, I think more about camera movement and feelings in in camera movements, um, and and that part is is um, the way how people with dyslexia are are uh, their brain works in that kind of way, and um, and and that's a big part. Like the first thing that you your brain lights up and and you're in that space. Mm -hmm. feeling uh, and and that's with accessible reading it's it's more like a logical yeah linear way of thinking uh, and bringing that in in in, um, in in the light part of your brain uh, it's yeah it's, it's really hard to explain in, in in a way that people understand it um, but yeah when you struggle you need to use be aware of what you're struggling about. Yeah. You also you had, had the had great the, um, idea of problem solving the issues yeah. in front of the text, didn't you? So can you explain a bit more about that, what you did to the actual letters to make them more... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, yeah, when I uh, started, it was like, okay, I need to um, make a layout of a book, a dyslexia-friendly, uh, graphic design manual uh, for people with dyslexia and and I was like okay the book the page uh, and then I ended with it's in the letters um, and and I was like looking at all the rules like you make all the letters uh, the same and and for people with dyslexia when you confuse letters and you make twin letters it's it's like ridiculous so I, I became aware of that moment of what my brain was doing with processing the letters in my head. And, and when I was aware of that, it was just flipping around, taking it to the visual area of my brain and like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm flipping, rotating and mirroring. It's all 3D movement with a 2D letter. It's crazy. I need to use my, my my visual part of my brain to s design it so you don't flip and rotate and mirror them anymore. So uh, yeah, that, that was like, the idea and the design was like in a split second. Uh, and then later on the bigger capital letters and all the errors that I make and all the other people with dyslexia make uh, were put into it and it was like, for all falling within a couple of seconds to, to to the paper and then 
designing the stuff and making the stuff was a whole different story. That took uh, <laughs> a half year for the basic, uh, and it was long, long, long days. But uh, it, the, I, the basic idea, when you take the first uh, design and the last design, you, most people would don't see the difference uh, between it. But it's, uh, <laughs> Website. Sorry, people can download the font from your website. Yeah, uh, we have also a new uh, Chrome extension uh, that people can download uh, for free, so you can read everything online uh, in Dyslexia. So uh, most reading is online these days. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, so and and we try to. to uh, make an, an kind of an office suite online uh in end october uh, there will be also a free version of that uh it's a kind of a g suite uh thing but then uh dyslexia office uh where you can work online in all kinds mm -hmm. of programs and that will be available for free in uh, october as we get practical tools yeah 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 it's it's on the end uh, when I designed it, it, I was still in school, and they said, yeah, uh, I was thinking, okay, I need to finish school, but I want to end the product that I can use myself. Uh, I didn't know that there were so many dyslexics around the world. I was thinking I was one of the hundreds uh, <laughs> in the world. Uh, never knew that it was learning problem number one in all around the world. So uh, yeah. it, it's brought me myself in a different world and next to the design also learned a lot of myself uh, um, what I did in the past uh, and what is dyslexia dyslexia uh, thinking dyslexia talking like uh, not a lot of dyslexic uh, yeah just just understand each other much better because they jump jump and jump uh but i do know that my some of my friends were like it's it's the chris humor humor or he's creative so he <laughs> he's but this was my dyslexia all the time so yeah, yeah, yeah. so Aaron, I have a question to you. we loved it when you said that um in elementary school you're told to be the same fit in be exactly like everyone else and then the moment you graduate, the world tells you to be different, stand out, and be better. We just thought that was so wonderful. So how does changing the definition of dyslexia affect us all? I think it's the fact that the fact that the and I do like that quote. I also I said the quote, but I do like it. Um, <laughs> Say it again. But, yeah, <laughs> I probably won't. But the idea that when we're in school, we're told to be the same. We're told to be like one another. We're told to sit in a class, do the same test, do this. I mean, just the word standardized testing alone to me is idiotic. And then you step out of the system and in order to succeed, in order to, especially in the creative field, but I think in any field, in order to succeed, in order to, to make yourself known, you're, you have to be different. You have to stand out. So why were we taught to just be the same. Maybe some of those subjects are important to a degree, but there should be other things taught so that then when we step out into the real world, the differences, the things that make us unique as humans, all of us here, the seven of us I'm looking at, it's, we're all very unique and different personalities who have incredible strengths. And in school, in the classroom, we were all told to do the same exact thing. And that to me is, is a broken part of the system that we need to change because like i'll give a specific example uh from a couple of days i was on a set i was just i was in a project and i was an 80 i was a guy from the 80s and i had to imitate like you know be like someone from the 80s who was uh like mr cool playing video games it was it was a pretty uh, out there project and really fun. And and I got to use the dyslexia in me, the creative brain, the learning disability brain in me to think, oh, here, let me visualize how I wanna do this, how I wanna create this character, what I wanna do to work within the means of the project so that we can make this place come alive. The sets were amazing. It was really a great thing. 
None of that, zero parts of that were things that I was taught or encouraged to do or encouraged to be in, in the school system, none of it. And that is, I didn't have on, I didn't, I wasn't doing math. I wasn't doing science. I wasn't doing history. I was being a version of the me that, that makes me who I am. And that is what I got to do in a day's work, not the stuff we're taught in school, which is why I believe that we all need to scream. I am able because we are all able. We just might not have been brought up to be told that we are able. We might have been told we have we are disabled. We have a invisible disability. But does that mean that's actually who we are? No, that is not who we are. We are all very able and we just have a different way of being able. Yeah. That makes sense. Lenny. Um, so do you think, and this is a question to everyone, do you think that if school was easier, that our brains would evolve to problem solve to the level that they can now? Because I think there's something in our struggle that ignites the evolution brain and helps us to adapt and evolve and be better. Um, so not, not that I want to forgive the school and forgive the institutions that create the bureaucratic rules to stop us from succeeding, but there's something in having to struggle that I think has has value even though it destroys us and we all have insecurities and mental health as a consequence this struggle breeds innovation yeah does struggle may evolve us i like to use the word evolve because it sounds like we're evolved <laughs> <laughs> so you um, get uh, perseverance um i think uh you get get yeah i think i do think uh, you it trains you to be a problem solver all the time it's 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 um, it's good, but it brings also a lot of damage. Not by everyone. It depends also on on how the par parents react, how your upbringing is, uh, mm -hmm. friends. Yeah. Your as well. yeah. Yeah. It's the, uh, I think it's it's two pronged because I uh, a phrase I say all the time is limitations breed creativity. So the more that we have different limitations, the more our creativity can come alive or whatever we're, we're, we're good at comes alive because we're, we're put into a box and said, come out of that box and figure it out. So that's one side of it. But then there's a big other side that I think is, uh, sh should not go unnoticed. There, the seven of us here are fortunate enough to be on this, to be talking to each other. It's like 70%. I didn't know all this before I started this I am able project, but 70% of the incarcerated community has some form of learning disability. They weren't allowed the opportunity to let their struggle get them out of the situation they were in. So they took their disability to the streets and ended up in the prison system. And I've talked to some of these people and it's a very, uh, so it, it's a double edged sword a bit because I agree that it, our struggles make us who they are unless our, unless the system and our struggles put us in prison. Mm -hmm. And so, or, or some version of prison can be a, a metaphor for whatever mental prison we're in, uh, mental health prison we're in, whatever it might be. And so I think uh, that that's where I, I go personally to, there's no, there's no black and white, there's a lot of gray area. And I think mm -hmm. that concept has a lot of gray area to it. Because yeah. we can all sit here and be bells and whistles about it, which is fun, yeah. bells and whistles are nice. But I think it's also important to look at the other side. I, I hope that though, one day, sorry, Lenny, I hope that one day there will be as much emphasis on art, drama, sculpture, photography, as is on English, maths, and all the sciences. Yeah. I really do, because I think, you know, while you are in the school system and and dyslexics do struggle and, and that breeds innovation and 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 hard work. I think some children just get crushed at school yeah. because they just, you know, as children, they don't have all the tools to, you know, cope with it, which we gain when we get older. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just, you know, music and, and art and painting and sculpture, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. And the revenue it brings into the UK is, you know, we don't talk about how much all the fashion designers and all the music bring in. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, and the film and TV industry. Yeah. I mean, it's huge, isn't it? 
Um, in LA, we talk about it a lot, all the time. Yeah. Film industry, yeah, it brings in all the money, but I think it, this is the only place that yeah. does that. Everywhere else doesn't do it. Yeah. And I, and LA is, it's kind of a, annoying how so much people talk about it. So yeah, it would be great if it, there was just balance everywhere, more balance. Yeah. You know, we also love what you used to say, um, Aaron, about having, a collaboration class where you learn to work with, because that's how we work in the real world, isn't it? You can't be good at everything. You know, we work really well together. Gil's got his team, Lenny and Kaz work together. Aaron, I know Tim as well as we know you, and, and I'm sure Christian's the same. So, but, I mean, you had other ideas of collaboration classes and... Yeah, I, I really believe that the five basic subjects, which are based, I believe, on... British academia, which came over here, and it's now, and it's been really the same since the Civil War. I think it's like an identi almost identical education that we're getting, and society has changed a lot. So yeah. one of the most important things is to know where, I know what I'm good at, and I know what I'm not good at, so I have to know how to collaborate. Mm -hmm. And and every, no matter what your work environment is, you have to know how to collaborate. So a, a classroom that's about collaboration with a bunch of different subjects and everyone has to collaborate to accomplish a certain goal. I'm not an educator, but in my, in my head, that makes sense is to me, like that would be a great subject. And then the, the arts like should be a subject, the arts in some fashion. And then the people who are great at science and math who aren't so good at art, well, they get to experience and feel what that's like to be, to have to push, their limits, sort of like what you were saying before about about our struggles can make us who who we are. Well, then everyone should have to struggle in some way so that everyone can be elevated to yeah. to see where they're good and where they're not good. Yeah. So yeah, I, think, I want to let's right now let's just rewrite the education system for the world. Yeah, let's do it. What, what, I, uh, what I see the last couple of years, and that gives me a lot of hope for a better education system, is that uh, Ernst & Young and Microsoft are now hiring on neurodiversity. So they, they make teams with all kind of neurodiversity in it, so the whole team can tackle any problem. And I hope that schools will pick on this and say, okay, if if all the workforce are waiting for this, what are we doing in kind of civil war education system? <laughs> <laughs> we, just, uh, we have to be really, so when massive companies basically do this kind of thing, uh, you could call it greenwashing, pinkwashing, neurodivergent washing, whatever, um, yeah. be extremely careful in terms of like how that, we want to enter those worlds. Of course we do. We want to be successful. We want to enter the big companies and have flash cars and big houses. And, no, we you don't. know, well, no, I mean, we, we want to sit on nice sofas and live in nice houses. Generally, everyone kind of does. So Second the idea is. The idea, sofas. But, um, but the idea is that um, we've got to be, we're pushing an idea that sort of the, the um, uh, neurodivergent, um, sort of dyslexic people want to. Um, be more free, we change the education system and so on. These these organizations have survived and become hugely successful in a system which debil debilitates all of us. And so we've got to be really careful in that if we are entering these organizations and which we all kind of want to, and it's, it's fun to do, and there's lots of wonderful opportunities within them, um, mm -hmm. that we don't adhere to the system that they um, yeah, specifically su succeed. Those, those companies are, are already there. Uh, and I know from my work that uh, there are a lot of dyslectics already working there, but they hide their dyslectics. How many emails I get from people like, I need this for my work, but I don't want my boss to know that I have dyslexia because the next round I'm out. It's crazy. And now they are they doing research. And they are looking at, okay, these persons are already working or we can hire them, but we don't need to let them type emails, let them do other stuff that we need also. It's 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 reevaluate their assets, their their people that they already have. It's not that everybody is in prison and we're the seven 
with dyslexia that are getting out, there are a lot of people that know, like they got children and those have tested for dyslexia and they like, I got the same school education experience. Probably I have dyslexia myself. Uh, okay, I'm working here 15 years. I'm now gonna tell that I have dyslexia after years of uh, reports and years of, it's it's a hard world sometimes. It's it, when you're creative, it's it's more accepted that you have dyslexia because you're a visual learner or a visual. Yeah, that's why they need to change the connotation of the word so that when you say you're dyslexic, you think of the good things. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. I mean, you know, it was it was kind of amazing that we had this uh, wonderful class join us today because it's really how we make the change, how we make the paradigm change. Part yeah. of it is on us. We keep using the word disable or learning differences, you know, or even collaboration. Really, collaboration is inclusiveness. When we're looking at organizations, as we work with our clients as well, Christian, I mean, very similar is that actually my talent adds to their differences of the team because we see it differently and the solutions are greater than just if we're all dyslexic or non-dyslexic i also love what you guys are talking about about really looking at and i think uh aaron you were talking about it's the whole person you know i'm able or i am who i am i'm not just dyslexic first of all dyslexia didn't happen to me i was born with it it's a gift but it's only part of who i am you know so when we focus on only what i can do we're leaving like so much of our talent and abilities on the sidelines and really not feeding our, our, our strength and our abilities and our ability to be able and work together and collaborate. You know, it's, it's as much on us, I think, as on the rest of the community to sort of change the narrative and, and step up as so many of us don't come out and say we're dyslexic, actually, you know, be able to speak up and say, you know, I'm dyslexic. And therefore, I can think outside the box. I can solve problems in different ways. I can visualize. I can tell stories that are greater than just what you're seeing on the lens. You know, it's it's much deeper than that. It's, uh, I mean, one of the things we do so well is we can see through things, around things, above things, below things. And we do it all at the same time, you know, in the blink of an eye. And that is how can you argue that that is not a massive talent that can affect any industry and for that, we can see how so many dyslexic change so many worlds, you know? Lenny, what are you going to add to that? Um, I was going to say, I think we can only do it, though, when we're in our own, when we have cultivated our own environment. So all of us, I'm assuming, run our own business. We could not be as successful as we are now if we were working for another organization, which is, I think, what Kaz was trying to say, that they... they organizations might say no okay well this is what i know no. um so i i feel like organizations say that they want diversity and they want you in the team but then when you're in the team they're not really able to accommodate yet because there is still prejudice about making mistakes and the more a dyslexic feels that they are on the spot the more mistakes they will make and they will have more dyslexic days then they need to have and by that i mean they'll make more errors based on their stress and there's this idea that if a dyslexic is calm and happy and relaxed they make less mistakes and we probably can all relate to that when well, we're stressed we forget our keys or we forget to do something it's so, like it's, i mean so i was reading an article today i'm doing some work for um the london south bank university which is basically they're just doing a research study into um, the dyslexic aesthetic, basically. They're asking uh, four students and two filmmakers to uh, create pieces of work of how they think, based on a kind of uh, a desktop documentary style, which is basically using YouTube videos and whatever's on your, your desktop, basically, to make a film using screen capture. Um, but anyway, I was looking, sort of researching and so on, and it basically said that, that sort of obviously that when you're more unhappy, you need to learn in a certain way, and when you're when you are happy, you're more to, you're free to innovate. You're free to create, basically. Um, mm -hmm. No, no, it's a big deal. Yeah, you know, it's. Um, I know we're sort of coming up on the hour, so and I'm sure we can talk for for, for hours and hours on this because it's just so interesting and so needed. Um, you know, acceptance is, starts with, within, right? When I'm happy, dyslexia or not, I project that, and my community feels that. Uh, you know, gratitude and contentment and participation, and I become part of our 
you know, uh, our community. I, I think it probably has to do with just being a human, uh, dyslexic or not. You know, I, I also think that uh, when you guys were talking about earlier around the different types of education and different types of classes, that itself is an old metaphor. Like wanting to have art, wanting to have other types of, of things, that's a, also siloing that experience. So if we are all learning differently, why can I learn math through art? Why can I learn, you know, poetry or English through acting or through singing or through making, you know? Uh, I think that would benefit not only dyslexic, but everyone to be able to sort of use the whole person, regardless of how you see and you learn. And um, I just can't can't wait to see more and more of that coming to life. I know that all of you do it with your teams because your work wouldn't have that sort of shine and glow and positivity if it wasn't that you guys were playing through the lens of dyslexia telling stories, making graphics and art to change the narrative. And I really appreciate that. I, I would love as we close to go around and hear, what would you guys say to a young dyslexic artist or designer or filmmaker or you know, a, a person that is sort of looking for uh, um, that path and maybe is unsure about how to uh, tackle some of these challenges we talked about today? Let's start with you, Aaron. What, what, do you, what would you say to a young dyslexic that's trying to break into the industry and, and, and looking for some guidance? I would say a couple things. I would first say, no matter what, keep trying to stay true to you because a lot of people are gonna pull you in other directions and in different directions. And they're gonna say, fit this or fit that, fit this mold, fit that mold. But your best advocate, your best resource is yourself, is to make sure that you're being true to you. And then the second thing I'd say, which is sort of the opposite of that, is and also look around and learn as much as you can from everyone else and the way that they do things. Because and because as long as you're staying true to you, you're going to create what what is true to your creative sensibilities, to your visual sensibilities, to what you wanna, what story you wanna tell, and then learn from everyone else around you. Don't shut people off just because they're different and you don't understand them. Try to learn, try to keep asking questions, keep learning as much as humanly possible from others around you. And then that you, that inner you will become that much brighter and greater. And I'd also just finally say to them, Go get them, Tiger. You got this. Oh. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> Christian, what would you say to a young dyslexic that's trying to sort of overcome some of the things we talked about and, and, and looking for some guidance? Oh, yeah. Uh, if they are on school, I will say uh, <laughs> school will end. <laughs> um, but, yeah, enjoy your brain. Um, uh, yeah, make make it light for yourself. Uh, take your humor or your uh, fun, uh, and yeah, enjoy your own way of how your brain is working and how it is uh, doing. And yeah, listen to yourself in that kind of way. Uh, that would be my advice because sometimes I, I come across some artists, painters, and they do know that they have dyslexia, but they, their workflow is like all the way dyslexic, uh, and and but they don't know it's it's from their dyslexic brain. So that's sometimes an eye opener for them. Yeah, yeah, I uh, I can relate to that. You know, one of the things we always say is instead of trying to fix your dyslexia, feed it. Yeah. You know, and then we yeah. heard so much on our salons. You know. If you're a dancer, dance with it. If you're an actor, act with it. If you are a storyteller, tell stories through it. And uh, yeah. by embracing it, uh, we are sort of allowing it to be just another part of us and to, to take some of that tension and sort of make it calm down a little bit and feel more content, as Lenny was saying, just feeling more in your body, you know? I think that's great advice, Christian. Lenny, what would be your advice? Um, my advice would be actually the advice that I recently gave to a group of primary school children. Mm. And it was that you are a poet. I would tell kids that they are poets. And I would encourage them to learn to love reading through reading poetry. I think poetry is the best 
medium for poets, um, for, for dyslexics, and I think they're natural poets. And I think it's the most accessible way for young readers to enjoy reading. So I really think that poetry is the key to unlocking the fear that so many dyslexic children have of reading and also the way to love writing and to have that introduction into language and to love words. Because as soon as we stop being scared of words and reading as dyslexic children, we start to grow our confidence. And you know, how many, how many of us have said in adult life, oh, we're not readers or we don't read or I'm not a good reader. And I think to become an adult and to use language like that is so damaging for our self-esteem. So mm -hmm. I would encourage every single dyslexic child from as young as possible, I would ask their parents, their grandparents, their siblings to just enjoy poetry with, um, with that child until they, yeah, until they have the confidence to write their own poetry. And once they write mm -hmm. one poem and they, they have that sense of satisfaction that words no longer scare them, and that they can eat those words because you can eat words in a poem and they taste so good. Um, <laughs> I really think that that is the key to helping dyslexic children find their love for reading. Yeah, and it, it's, I love that you're saying that and sharing with young, uh, uh, young folks that sort of are struggling with words. Poetry is kind of like dyslexia because it doesn't go in a linear way. You can break the rules. You can tell stories that sort of brings emotions and metaphors and visualizations. So it's 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 that's amazing, super uh, uh, inspiring. Uh, Kaz, what would be some of your advice for young folks uh, that's trying to get into uh, into the creative world? Mm. It's a little bit based on um, a conversation we had um, just this weekend. We do a, um, a a chat much like this, um, just informally with lots of different neurodivergent artists. Um, but basically, we just you know we we open it up every every the last Sunday of every month. But anyway, um, they specifically the said, Sunday. "Oh, is it? Sorry, <laughs> no, sorry. it's something." Um, but but they said specifically they were very disillusioned about the creative industry and basically said that they're you know sort of lots of amazing animators that um, that are in the industry. They started when they were really young and. Um, they got into they were really famous by their time they were 22 and all that kind of stuff and they basically thought well this is this is it i'm 27 i'm too old now um which is obviously in our eyes pretty ridiculous um mm -hmm. but it's that idea of that sometimes within this industry it helps to have friends and family that are already in the industry it helps to have money to sustain you all that kind of stuff it's an extremely difficult thing to do to become a creative person to have a creative career unless you have those things in place. So based on what we were talking about earlier in terms of um, that you create your best work when you are happy, create if you can, if there's any way to do it, create stability. If that means that you're working in a restaurant while doing your creation, or if you're working, I don't know, like I did, which I guess was a kind of cool job, but I started off as a camera op operator in shopping TV, which is a cool job, but it's pretty low down in terms of what I thought coming out of university where I thought I'd be able to get, be able to get to. But it was a wonderful place for me to, to innovate, to practice, to play, and so on. And the same with, I don't know, Einstein, for instance. He was a patent clerk when he started. Um, and, and obviously a totally different industry and so on. But he, was, he said that was an extremely boring job. And it was really lame and kind of really low profile. But it allowed him to think. It gave him stability to be able to relax and think and play and, and innovate and become Einstein. So it's kind of like it's that idea of find find stability, basically. Yeah. yeah. Well, you guys, this was amazing. I, I I really enjoyed you guys' inside wisdom, your talent, the way you guys play with your dyslexia and create, tell stories. Uh, I know that the chat has been blown up with so many different sentiments about what you were saying and how people are sort of going to take this and and run with it. Um, I wanted to thank. Kate and Kathy for uh, being our muses, all things dyslexia, and I uh, invite you all to check out the uh, you know the show that just came uh, off, Dyslexia Beautiful Minds. Uh, it's online at the Inside uh, Out uh, uh, website, and uh, we are excited to bring it to San Francisco. So if you are in the San Francisco or the U.S. and would love to participate, please uh, send us an email at dyslexia at gershoni.com. And uh, we would love to hear from you and uh, get you involved. 
Uh, we are having so many more projects coming up uh, this year and next year. Uh, we're about to release our uh, podcast of these shows so people can listen to them as well and enjoy the content. We are putting together another uh, a special event in October, celebrating a year of our salon series with Kate and Kathy. And we're going to have a special event celebrating Dyslexia Awareness Month in the U.S. as well as Dyslexia Awareness Week in the U.K. And uh, if you guys haven't got your hands on this gorgeous book, uh, please go and get it because this is these are the stories of all these uh, ordinary and amazing dyslexic doing wonderful things in their uh, worlds and career. And uh, <laughs> part of it. So um, thank you, everybody. And uh, have a wonderful, wonderful day, afternoon and evening. And thank you to our audience for joining. If you love what you hear today, please help us raise this content to the top by subscribing to our channel and following us and sharing with friends and family in your community. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. That was lovely. Uh, Cheers. Never enough time, is there? Chow, chow. Yeah. Never. Thank you so much. It's been lovely. I just... Should I say wait? Um, so, hang on.